Hello and welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2020. I'm Laura Guadagnoli, a ninth grader at Brunswick High School. Here in our studio today, I'm joined by Kelly and Jennifer, and today we're exploring green growth. Thank you, Laura. I'm Kelly Hill, a green growth specialist with the Coastal Resources Division, and I've been here for 13 years. Uh, part of my job is to provide technical assistance, tools and resources to our local governments and other co coastal stakeholders on issues related to sustainable development. And I'm Jennifer Klein. I am a coastal hazard specialist with Coastal Resources Division, and I've been with our department for 20 years. I work with Kelly on sustainability and resiliency, and we'd like to show you a short video about what we do every day for DNR. We'll be back to answer your questions via YouTube and Facebook afterwards. Every day more Georgians are going green. If you've been wondering how you can join in, we've got a few ideas you can start with at home. One example is through native landscaping. Native species are more adapted to local conditions and do not require fertilizers, pesticides, or supplemental irrigation once plants are established. This reduces your impact on our water supply and the amount of chemicals entering the environment. Native grasses also have an extensive root structure, which allows for better water absorption, filtering of pollutants, and soil stabilization. Native plants will also provide extremely valuable habitat for many species and help protect the biodiversity of the coastal region. Another way to live green is through conserving water. Using rain barrels is a great way to do your part. The average U.S. household uses 146,000 gallons of water per year, and over half of that goes towards outdoor irrigation. Consider using collected rainwater instead for your outdoor water uses. With an average annual rainfall of nearly 50 inches, there is a huge potential to harvest rainwater in coastal Georgia. With our average rainfall amounts, if you were to harvest everything that fell on a small 1,000 square foot rooftop area, you could collect almost 40,000 gallons of water each year. Rain barrels are relatively simple and inexpensive to construct and can sit conveniently under any residential gutter downspout. Placed under one of your downspouts, rain barrels collect rainwater that you can use to water your gardens and lawns, wash cars, or even fill bird baths and ponds. Plants also prefer rainwater to the treated water that comes from your city or county water treatment plant. Rainwater has a more neutral pH and temperature and is free of added minerals and chemicals that may affect your plants. Larger cisterns are another great option for harvesting rainwater. These cisterns can collect up to 6,000 gallons of rainwater from this rooftop which is then used to wash down boats, trailers, and field gear. Our rooftop here is approximately 3,800 square feet, so with one inch of rain, these cisterns can capture over 2,000 gallons of water. In addition to conserving water by using this rainwater for some outdoor uses, you are also helping to limit pollution through something called stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is the number one cause of pollution in our streams today. Rainfall that flows off impervious surfaces such as rooftops, roads, and parking lots pick up pollutants along the way, such as fertilizers, motor oil, sediment, and other contaminants. Usually runoff is routed to a nearby storm drain, which then enters our coastal streams untreated. And all of this eventually enters our fragile coastal estuaries, which are our most productive areas for coastal fisheries and recreation. The influx of additional fresh water as well as the pollutants are causing major problems in these sensitive areas. An alternative is to encourage the rainwater to infiltrate back into the ground on site through something called low impact development techniques. These include rainwater harvesting, permeable pavement, and bioswales. By using the harvested rainwater on plants and other vegetated areas on your property, you are keeping the water on site instead of letting it run off and become stormwater pollution. Another option is a bioswale, which is a depressional area designed to capture and treat stormwater runoff from an adjacent impervious surface such as this parking lot. The native grasses planted here will help filter pollutants out of the stormwater and assist in removing some of the water through evapotranspiration. This is a great alternative to routing parking lot runoff directly into a storm drain. So now you have a place to start on your journey towards a greener life. Be sure to check out more ideas, including a step-by-step -step guide on constructing your own rain barrel at home on the Coastal Resources Division website. All right, welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. Kelly and Jennifer are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. 
To ask a question, use the chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our live Facebook feed. To use the YouTube Live chat, you'll need to sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastalgadnr.org slash coastfest. While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few of my own. How much does a basic rain barrel cost to build? That is a good question, Laura. Um, it can really vary depending on what types of materials you use and how large you want your rain barrel to be. Um, you can buy prefabricated rain barrels from most larger hardware stores, such as Lowe's or Home Depot, and they can range from anywhere from $50 to $200. You can also build your own, um, buying parts from the hardware store, um, or you can participate in one of our Build Your Own Rain Barrel workshops. We charge $30 just to cover the cost of the kits that you'll use to construct your rain barrel. Um, we do that in person, so we'll hopefully be able to start hosting those again soon. It's a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about rainwater harvesting, and then you leave with a fully functional rain barrel. Um, we get our drums donated from the Coca-Cola plant in Jacksonville, um, which is really helpful for our program. You can learn more about upcoming workshops on our website at coastalgadnr.org slash greengrowth. And it looks like we have um, a question from Kawhi Destar. She asks, what if the rain water causes a runoff from an area that animals graze on? Is it still safe to use? That is a good question. Um, so rainwater that we're, we're talking about from a rain barrel is typically something that you're going to use outside your home. This is not typically used for a drinking water source or for water inside your home. Um, we want to use this for outdoor irrigation um, and sometimes for washing down vehicles and things of that nature. So yes, if you are um, collecting rainwater from a source that would have a lot of bacteria from animal waste, you definitely want to be careful about how you use that water because it will be slightly contaminated. But it would be perfectly safe to um, use on some vegetation or plants in your yard. But you don't want to drink that water. Uh, we have a question from Leslie Jones, second grade class. Um, how do you know that the water is clean? Um, again, it really depends on what you're collecting the rainwater off of. Um, so for the example in our video where we had um, those two large cisterns um, that is collecting rainwater off of a metal roof that doesn't have a lot of tree canopy and there's really not a lot of pollen or debris landing on there, but we do have you know, birds that fly over and may um, drop some things along the way. And so we do filter that water before it goes into the tank and then after it comes out of the tank. Um, but again, we're only using that for outdoor water use. Um, Rainwater harvesting into a rain barrel um, is really not something you want to use for, your, for inside your home or for drinking water. Okay, next question from Kyra Norris. Can you have more than one rain barrel at your home? That is a great question. Yes, you definitely can have more than one. Um, you can either go with one large rain barrel. You can have um, capacity from anywhere from 35 gallons up to some larger containers at your house can be up to 500 gallons. The cisterns that we have at our office are 3,000 gallons each. Um, if you have the smaller rain barrels, we teach you at our workshop actually how you can connect them together. It's very easy to do, and you can do it in a way where they all um, level together, and you only need one spigot to drain all of them at one time. And then the next question is from Virgil Hobby. Where do you get rain barrels? Um, there are lots of sources online. A simple Google search will bring up many different vendors online. Um, like I said, you can go to your local larger hardware stores and purchase them there. But we definitely recommend coming to one of our workshops. I think that is the least expensive and most fun way to get a workshop, because, um, to get a rain barrel, because you get to learn all about the benefits of rainwater harvesting. And then you build it yourself, and you can get creative with painting it um, and learning how to install it at your home. All right, another uh, question from Ms. Jones' second grade class. Asking, can you drink the rainwater? Um, no, we definitely don't recommend that you drink the rainwater that you collect in your rain barrel. Um, we're trying to offset some of our drinking water by using the rainwater for our outdoor water needs, such as watering our plants um, and other vegetation. Um, the, the water that comes from your, that's treated from your city or county is the water that we want to use for, for the drinking water purposes. There are some parts of the world where rainwater is their only source of clean water. So in that instance, they would have to take those extra steps to treat it and make sure that it is safe to drink. 
but in a basic residential rain barrel, that is um, usually not cost effective to put those treatments in place. All right, the next question is from Carsey Bug. If you place the rain barrel under your roof, how is it that healthy for the plants or whatever you use it on? Um, it is very healthy for the plants in that um, the, the rainwater that we collect is a more neutral temperature and pH, and so it's the water that the plants are used to receiving. When you use your treated water from the county or city, it goes through a treatment process before it comes out of your host spigot. And so there are added minerals and sometimes chemicals, and it's also a different temperature. So it's been through a lot of processes before it comes out of the end of that hose. And so while it's not bad for your plants, the rainwater is actually preferred. So it's a, it's a better source for, your, for watering your plants. Um, the next question is from Ali Lancaster. Do you ever find trash in your rain barrels? That is a good question. Um, yes, you want to be careful about something we call pre-filtering. So you want to, um, if you're setting up a rain barrel off of a roof, rooftop gutter and downspout, as you know around here, we have lots of leaf litter that falls on our rooftops and we have to occasionally clean out those gutters. You can buy little gutter guards, a little mesh basket that you put into um, the entry down into your downspout, that, that keeps a lot of the debris from entering into your rain barrel. Um, you also want to make sure all of the openings are covered with a window screening so that mosquitoes don't fly in and lay their eggs in there and breed in that standing water. Standing water is a great place for mosquito breeding, so we want to make sure we're always keeping those openings covered with window screening. And you want to check your rain barrel periodically for things in there and clean it out at least once a year. We recommend right after we get all of that pollen in the springtime and everything is covered in that yellow pollen, that's a great time to go ahead and dump out your rain barrel, clean it out, and start fresh. And then the next question, uh, Michaela Schaefer, how long does it take to make a rain barrel? I think that's meant to say rain barrel. Um, well, at our workshops, they're two hours long, but that includes um, an educational presentation with some questions and answers. We go through all of the steps to construct the barrel and then we actually step outside and build the rain barrel and help all of the participants through the steps. Um, and sometimes we can finish all of that in about an hour and a half. If you were to do this at home, you could probably construct the barrel in about an hour. It's a very simple process. We also have a video online if you're not able to make it to one of our workshops and you're able to find a nice sturdy plastic drum from a local hardware store, um, and you can buy the kits online. You can do it yourself that way. Um, there's a video on our website that takes you through all of the steps in constructing the barrel as well. Okay, the next question um, from Kawhi to Stars, I think it's a biology class. How can we assure freshness of the water and know it's safe to use for irrigation of the plants? Um, Again, it really depends on what surface you're collecting the rainwater off of. If you have a rooftop that is covered in leaves, and um, I like to call the little squigglies from the oak trees or the catkins, um, you're going to have a lot more um, organic material accumulating in your barrel, so you're going to want to clean it out more frequently. If you have an area that's covered in bird droppings or things like that, again, it's going to need to be cleaned out more frequently. But um, to put that on plants is, is perfectly fine. The one thing you may want to be careful on is sometimes you can put a pump into a rain barrel to pressurize it and use like a spray on a hose. When you um, pressurize water and you put it into the air like that as an aerosol, sometimes different components can be airborne. So if you have a really dirty water source, you want to make sure that you put those filters in place beforehand and that you're cleaning your barrel regularly and probably not a great idea to, to hook up a sprayer to that. That's a new question. Okay, from Allie Lancaster. Have you ever had a rain barrel break? If so, what do you do? Um, yes, we've had rain barrels break. Um, they're made out of mostly plastic materials, which makes them um, pretty durable and affordable. Um, but typically, the main part that you would have issues with um, is where it connects to your downspout. Sometimes that will leak, so you can buy um, basic water caulking and kind of secure that seal that way. Um, all of the kits that we use in our workshops, um, you can also buy the parts individually, so if one part cracks or breaks, then you can replace that. Um, the thing that 
that makes things degrade fastest is the sun. So if your barrel is sitting in direct sunlight, then you're, you're going to maybe have to replace some of those parts more frequently. And we definitely recommend painting your barrel if you use a white drum, because sunlight will go right through that drum and cause a lot of algae to grow in the water inside. So painting will um, be necessary and you'll want to refresh that painting as much as you can. Oh, yes. Um, so this question is from Jackson Hudson. Can a rain barrel survive a hurricane? That is a great, great <laughs> question. Um, they definitely can survive a hurricane. Um, I have them on my house, survived um, Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Irma. In fact, I was able to utilize the um, water that was in our rain barrel um, to flush toilets when we didn't have any power. So um, it's definitely um, survivable. Um, they don't necessarily mitigate for the water that we get from hurricanes, um, but you can definitely um, make them so that they will survive and you can utilize them. Will rainfall amounts be different as our climate changes? Um, that's a great question as well. Yes. Um, we will see uh, definitely definite, definite changes um, in weather patterns with, with climate change. We'll see droughts come up, um, so where we will have um, less of, of rainfall. We'll also see an increase um, in between years um, where it will bring in more flooding, more precipitation. Um, our sea levels will, are rising, and so that will um, exacerbate some of the flooding that we see coming in as well. A question from Miranda Anderson. How long does it take for the rain barrel to be filled with the rainwater? That is a really good question. Here in coastal Georgia, not long at all. We have a tremendous amount of rainfall every year. Um, this summer in particular, we've seen a lot of that. Um, so a typical rain barrel on your home would be 30 to 50 gallons, and that would fill up in a, a very small summer storm. And so the um, way that you can calculate how much water you can collect off of your rooftop if you have a 1,000 square foot rooftop area, you can collect over 600 gallons of water with one inch of rain. So there's huge potential um, off of a small part of your home to collect enough rainwater to water the plants in that area. Why is it important to conserve water? It's very important to conserve water. Um, we are very fortunate here in coastal Georgia to have a very clean, drinking water source with the Floridian Aquifer, but there are you know, potential issues that Jennifer can elaborate on with future sea level rise that may cause problems with um, saltwater intrusion. And we want to save that treated drinking water for the things we really need it for, for our drinking and indoor water use, and try to offset that use with some um, outdoor water use with rainwater. Jennifer, do you want to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I'll just say that um, conserving water, as Kelly has mentioned, definitely um, leaves the drinking water um, for us, the treated water for us to use for consumption. Um, and by pulling water out of the aquifer, um, it, does, um, it does make us more vulnerable to saltwater intrusion, what will come up through where we get our drinking water from, from the aquifers. And so um, by minimizing that impact, it, it definitely um, saves our drinking water. Um, we also have another question coming in from Caitlin Ball. What areas of the coast are most vulnerable to sea level rise? So I would say um, all of our six coastal counties have vulnerabilities to, to sea level rise. Um, most of them are the low-lying areas um, with low elevation. Um, obviously, the shorefront areas um, of, our, of our communities, um, and then anywhere um, that has marsh or is a wetland, um, we know that those are going to be areas susceptible. Um, and so we have a lot of um, mechanisms in place that will help us adapt and mitigate to that. Um, raising your homes when, if you're building a new home to be out of that high hazard um, rise area. We are looking at in coastal Georgia um, anywhere between three and a half feet to six and a half feet by the year 2100 of sea level rise. And so we really like to um, start taking a look at being able to um, adapt to some of those changes here in coastal Georgia. 
Where do you get native plants for landscaping? That is a good question. There um, are lots of different places you can find native plants. We talked about this a little bit in the video. Um, native plants are a great um, option here in coastal Georgia. They are, um, once established, you don't need to worry as much about irrigation or adding any pesticides. So it helps you know, remove some of those pollutant sources from the water. Um, and also they provide really good habitat for some of our native species. There are um, some local resources where you can find some native plants to purchase. There all, are also online options. Some of our um, coastal partners have really good resource, resources on their websites as well to kind of search um, in more detail on native plants, not only choosing what types of native plants you may want to use, but also where to find them. One in particular is the University of Georgia's Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant Office here in Brunswick. They have um, Ecoscapes program, which you can find by searching online, and they have a lot of resources there. And also another one locally here is Coastal Wildscapes. They do a lot of work with native plants as well. Um, another question from Janae Holmes. What other ways can we use the rainwater besides using them for irrigation and landscaping? Um, well, that's a good question. So it depends on the size, right? So if you have a small rain barrel, it's not gonna be enough water to do um, really large scale projects with, but you know, we have seen some people use them to fill bird baths, um, to fill, to help supplement um, other water features on their property. Um, you can connect different hoses to your rain barrel. So if you raise it up off the ground a couple of feet, you're gonna get a little more pressure. You can attach a soaker hose to that and just let the water run out through a line of shrubs or plants that way. Um, we've also, you know, if you have a clean rooftop and the water's not, you know, coming off of a very dirty source, you can use it to wash your vehicles. Um, that's another good option as well. Yeah, we use it here to wash our, flush our boats and wash our, you know, our boats off when we pull them out of the salt water. That's another really good use for people yes, here on the coast. Definitely. Okay. Okay, this is from Myra Gee, um, Miss Just at McIntosh County Academy. Are rain barrels suitable for apartment complexes and will they help with water irrigation? as well as money savings in the community? That is a really good question. So we talk about scale. So you see small rain barrels on a home versus like the cisterns we, we showed in the video that are 6,000 gallons of capacity. You can get even larger than that. And you do see them a lot on commercial applications or even larger residential applications such as apartment complexes or condominiums. Um, and so you can hook some larger cisterns like that into an existing irrigation system that's already running in the ground. And so you, you put in the proper uh, mechanisms there, you can connect it to your existing sprinkler system. You wanna make sure you're, prevent, you're cleaning that water a little bit, you'll have to filter it a little more so you're not clogging up your lines. And also put in something that's called a backflow preventer so you're not um, allowing any contamination of your rainwater to go into the city water source that is there to supplement the irrigation um, in other larger cities, you will see rainwater harvesting used quite a bit in very large scale. Um, in Georgia, we are allowed to use rainwater inside the home for gray water use. So you'll see them in some buildings, they'll use the rainwater to flush the toilets inside the building. Um, that is another great way to save water. Rather than using that treated water for something like toilet flushing, you can use that harvested rainwater instead. Um, we have another question from Caitlin Ball. Are increasing numbers of hurricanes and sea level rise um, linked? Yes, it's called climate change. <laughs> um, we, we really are, the science shows that we're gonna start to see more intense hurricanes, which I think um, we have seen that pattern in the last several years where the hurricanes um, are rapidly intensifying, um, which, which makes it really hard for emergency managers and meteorologists to predict um, the strength of them and when to evacuate. And that's really one of the struggles that we are starting to see. And that will only increase as climate change move, moves forward. Um, where, ex for instance, when it goes from a category one to a category four, in a matter of 24 hours. And that's really what we're expecting to see and what we are in fact seeing. Um, sea level rise is also um, an impact from climate change. Um, we are seeing the rates of sea level rise increase um, and, only, and it will only um, increase more as move, we move forward. Um, and so those are definitely linked. Some of the things that um, we are, Kelly and I are also um, 
things that we were talking about being able to mitigate for that is um, you know putting in some of these rain gardens for other types of stormwater to help offset some of those um, sea level rise impacts or um, some of the increased flooding. And so I think that um, they, they kind of come together as well for this. Yeah, we talk a little bit about something called green infrastructure or low impact development as a way to capture the rainwater that's coming from the upland and let it infiltrate into the ground through things like permeable pavement, bioswales, even smaller rain gardens, bioretention areas. And that takes a little bit of the pressure off of our systems where you're not having so much water coming from the upland and all of this water coming from the high tides and sea level rise kind of combining together. So trying yeah. to mitigate a little bit on the upland side as well. Okay, from Robert Todd um, from the MCA commercial fisheries class, what types of native plants can we plant here at school um, to help with rain runoff from our parking lot? Um, that is a really good question. There's lots of different options. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to help if anyone has specific questions. Jennifer and I are available to provide that technical assistance and come look at sites and provide some examples. Um, the resource I mentioned before that's probably the best for choosing native species would be at the UGA Marine Extension Georgia Sea Grant um, program that I mentioned before. Um, but we have several demonstration sites here on our campus as well where we've planted quite a few um, different um, native plantings and one of which is a, a small bioswale that is trying to do exactly what you're talking about where it's capturing that rainwater from the parking lot and helping absorb it quickly into the ground. So we have a lot of grasses in that bioswale. Um, a lot of it's personal preference, but you do want to choose the species that are going to be good at uptaking a lot of that moisture, can handle being wet, um, but also can handle periods of drought because you're not going to want to have to water it. And that's all the time we have for this session of Virtual Coast Fest. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division's mission. Tune in next time.